<clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, we're up and running. Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things Aviation. Godspeed to all of you as we navigate this COVID-19 pandemic. And welcome to our third edition. This is only the third show for this new initiative for the Bob Hoover uh, Legacy Foundation. And uh, hopefully you guys are, are seeing some value in what we're trying to do. You know, the ironies of the aviation world never cease to uh, amaze me. Um, this past Friday, I got a call from on my cell phone from uh, the famed Tuskegee Airman Brigadier General Charles E. McGee. So I went into anybody with a milita military background would do, and I popped tall and answered and I said, good afternoon, Brigadier General McGee. He cheerfully responded, hey, Vince, Charles here. At which point I said, how are you, General? To which he said, I'm doing well, just checking in to see how you're doing. We haven't spoken in a while. By the way, that a while had been about a week or two. So I'm thinking a couple of things at this point. This is a national treasure from the same generation as another national treasure, Bob Hoover, who called to check on little old me. He's going to turn 100 on December 7, and he wants to know how I'm doing. But you know, that's representative of the quality and the class of gentlemen from that generation, like Brigadier General Charles McGee and R.A. Bob Hoover. The irony, though, is that he happened to call me the day before my August 1st birthday without even knowing it. And secondly, I had recently discovered that Bob Hoover's autobiography of Forever Flying was published on my birthday in 1997. I, I consider that an amazing honor on both fronts. And by the way, if you haven't had a chance to read Bob Hoover's autobiography of <coughs> Forever Flying that included a forward from his good friend and flying colleague, Chuck Yeager, it's an amazing read. Even if you have, seen the documentaries like Flying the Feathered Edge, hosted by Harrison Ford and written and directed by Kimberly First, or Perfecting Flight, written and directed by Daniel Berman, Forever Flying will give you a perspective like none other. Speaking of Bob Hoover, I really had a fun call right after last week's show from a gentleman by the name of Fred Lark, whose signature greeting is kind of like a call sign or something. He always greets you with, whether it's on the phone or via email, with an enthusiastic, Heidi Ho. So I called him and he was like, Heidi Ho, Vincent. Anyhow, um, I thought it was gonna be a short conversation, maybe five minutes or so. He had a great story to share about a week that he spent with Bob Hoover in 1996. Of course, I was very little then, no, I'm just kidding. Um, at that time, he worked at North American Rockwell doing demos in a, what I call a rocket ship of a single engine, the Rockwell Commander 114. Uh, and he was doing that while Bob was flying the famed twin engine Shrike Commander. Well, the call ended up being 30 minutes and a chat that probably could have lasted a couple of hours. That's one of the greatest things about our industry, the bonds that we build with aviation as the common denominator. And speaking of great things, let me preface it by saying, listen, I love anything that flies, including the ones with rotating wings on top, helicopters. <clears throat> but I am a happy camper this week because Textron Aviation introduced the new Beechcraft King Air 360. You know, I don't, I don't think you understand. I've had a love affair with King Airs for over 50 years, which is interesting because I know I only look 40. Some of you may have noticed that I'm wearing the King Air 350 lapel pin. I don't know if you guys can see that. Bob Bluen gave me that years ago at an NBAA convention when he realized how much of a King Air fan that I am. So before we go full throttle with this show, I, I have to share one quick story about me and King Airs. When I was 12 years old, I saw a 16-year-old land a Cessna Skyhawk at Lambert Field, and I immediately realized I too could do that one day. So I went out the very next day and bought my first flying magazine. And I did what any kid would do. I 
the advertisements in there, I had gave you an opportunity to request brochures. So I requested a brochure for everything. Airplanes, aircraft batteries, aircraft tire, tow bars, you get the picture. One day we get a call at home and my mom answers and it's a sales rep from Beechcraft. Of course, my mom was a little bit bewildered why someone from Beechcraft will be calling our house. So she asked him, how can I help you? And he replied, I understand your son is interested in buying a King Air. And she told him, well, sir, my son is only 12 years old, but humor me. How much is that King Air thing? And he said, well, it's a few million dollars. Actually, I think it was a um, King Air 90 and they were probably three or four million back then. But anyhow, he said, tell you what, I'll check back with him in another decade or so. <laughs> he was actually a very nice guy. Of course, she got off the phone and she said, what was that about? And I ran to my bedroom and I grabbed my little brochure, actually big brochures. The, the marketing was not as sophisticated then, so the brochures were huge. Plus, I had this huge picture of a King Air 90 on my wall. And I showed all that to her. And she said, so how did you get this stuff? And I showed her and she said, okay, that's fine. Next time, leave off our phone number. And yeah, that's my, that's my King Air story. And that's how long, far back I go back with, with King Airs. Um, <laughs> fantastic aircraft. And I'm not just saying that just because Shannon's on the call. I really love that airplane. Um, okay, let's talk all things aviation. Let me introduce our distinguished panel of guests and aspiring young aviation professionals. Speaking of Beechcraft King Airs and the new King Air 360, meet Shannon Peterson. She is the regional sales director, director for Textron Aviation after a long list of things she's done over the years with them, I think over 25 years. Also, Michelle Wade. Michelle is a partner at Jetstream Aviation Law. Michelle also has had a very distinguished career over, again, another quarter of a century. And then there's Jeff Warford, Chief Pilot and Director of Aviation for Comscope. And Jeff can do no wrong because he's another Navy guy like me, so what can I say? And as far as our aspiring young aviation professionals, today we have Robert Morgan. He is a 2016 graduate from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, who's been a dispatcher at Penn Air in Alaska. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then Dylan Smith, a 2019 graduate, also from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University at Prescott, who's in the process of getting his certified flight instructor certificate and is uh, part of the Horizon Air Pilot Development Program, which he can explain a little bit more about uh, in a minute. Those are, those are great programs that some of the airlines have that uh, are a great track coming out of school. But I tell you what, let's, let's start with you, Robert. Um, like many, you've been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we were talking about that earlier and how Pen Air in Alaska is shutting down for a while. And now you've got to reconsider your track and your options as to what you uh, want to do. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about about that, about your background and, and what you're thinking about now that, that you've had this, uh, you know, a bit of a shift in your career. Uh, absolutely, Vince. So uh, as you said, I uh, came up to Alaska three years ago, right after I had graduated from Embry-Riddle and started working as a dispatcher for a regional up here called Pinair. It was a, it was a very difficult transition going from the Arizona desert to Alaska in the middle of winter. But it provided me with a very unique opportunity that a lot of people in aviation don't get to experience. And that is aviation Alaska. Things change so quickly and rapidly up here. Some of the best flying in the world, but it's also some of the most dangerous. Working as a dispatcher, I've, I've really enjoyed it because it was constantly a new challenge. And after I got promoted to a lead dispatcher, I had a full new set of challenges in front of me. And I loved the diversity in that. I love that, you know, one day I'm having to write training programs. The next I'm working with someone with the FAA regarding changing policy to meet procedures. And it was very, very dynamic. And it was a challenge and I enjoyed it. Well, with this COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, Penair got bought out by Raven a little while ago, 
and Raven ceased all operations due to the dropout of passengers. Uh, been like that for several months now, and it's really given me a lot of opportunity to sit down and think about going, okay, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot in the last three years, but where do I go from here? What's next? And Actually, um, I'm really glad that you have uh, Jeff on the panel today, very knowledgeable person. Uh, corporate aviation is something that's had a bit of a more interest to me because it is more dynamic. There's different challenges in corporate aviation that you don't see in the 121 and the 135 world. So um, Jeff, I was just kind of an open question for you. What do you think as for me, an aspiring pilot who spent the last three years dispatching for an airline. If any idea what would be a next step for me here? Yeah, I think you've got a lot of different opportunities. Uh, I think the biggest thing is while you're in Alaska, look at uh, what you can do uh, to transition into a flying role up there and then start putting out feelers. Uh, even with COVID-19, uh, you know, corporate aviation is, is picking back up. I think we're the last numbers I heard from the FAA administrator earlier this week was we're back up to like 83%. And so there's still a lot of stuff out there. And so, uh, I mean, the first thing to do is figure out what platform you want to try to fly on and then uh, go after it with everything you've got. And uh, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, I've had another question for you to kind of tag along with that. Um, how do you think the best way is to network within corporate aviation to reach out to make contacts? Well, I think the first step is to make yourself available. So when you, in your case, you're going to be flight instructing. When you're on a cross country, you stop in an FBO to get fuel. Make sure you take time to go into the pilot lounge, look who's sitting around, introduce yourself, uh, make friends. Uh, That's great. And, you know, Facebook has got uh, multiple. Uh, avenues you can follow I me mean, there's like with us we've got a we operate two challenger 300s and a learjet uh, facebook has a challenger 300 group and so you sign up on that uh, uh, the cjp which is cessna jet pilots uh, owners group has a big following and so you you sign up with that and, and start making contacts and so you've got a lot of these owner groups that are out there pilatus has one uh, Malibu, you know, Piper has their own version. Cirrus has their version. Uh, mm -hmm. They start making contacts that way through social media. And uh, that's a good first step, but nothing replaces face-to-face, -face, you know. So when you find yourself, socially distanced, of course, mm -hmm. but when you find yourself in a, in a uh, position to talk to somebody, don't be too bashful about it. You know, go up to ask them what they're flying, you know, and uh, uh, if you see them out on a ramp, just, just talk to them and, and that's, and, you know, start building relationships that way. And Dylan, I would definitely second that. And I'd also suggest uh, getting on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of aviation professionals are on LinkedIn and then the people that you meet, like Jeff was talking about either in the Facebook groups on LinkedIn or face to face, keep in touch with people. It was like Vince's uh, story about, you know, connecting with people, uh, that he's known uh, for decades. Um, keep in touch with people, let them know what you're doing. You never know when they might know the right opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks for that advice. Yeah, and Dylan, I mean, in, in my case, uh, I actually ended up in my corporate job because I was a flight instructor because I initially started flying uh, with, uh, at that time, our uh, president and CEO uh, he was work, wanting to work on his instrument rating. And so he and I started flying together and then, you know, did that for two years. And then, then I find myself with a job as a co-pilot. So, wow. you know, being a flight instructor can lead to a lot of opportunities as well. Yeah. That's, that's really cool here. How it can be so dynamic as who, you know, who you meet, how willing are you to reach out to people can then lead to a job rather than just sitting on Google and searching. Which, exactly. Exactly. But, Technology generation of myself making me the inclination to do. I've seen a lot of uh, pilots come up through the training organizations like Flight Safety. Um, if you work with them, you have daily access to the people flying those aircraft. Mm -hmm. So you impress them 
in your job there and uh, they'll think of you when they're looking for someone to hire. Mm. So the common denominator is, is making yourself visible and, and networking with whomever whenever you get a chance. That, that sounds like all of you are saying that. Absolutely. Yeah. That is so. key. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, well, can you give us a, a little bit more about how you got started? What, 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 was, what was your inspiration? You, you took an interesting track. Uh, you were in the Navy, but you weren't a pilot in the Navy. So um, as you said, so, uh, you used yeah, to so I graduated from high school, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. So uh, I discovered I didn't want to work in food service. So I joined the Navy. Um, I ended up my, my job. My job in the Navy was to shoot down airplanes. And uh, we uh, went into the shipyard after a couple of years. And I was told to come up with something constructive to do or I was going to get shipped out to another division, chip paint. So uh, I was at a, at a bar in Waikiki Beach, and a guy bet me a case of beer that I wouldn't jump out of an airplane. And so the following weekend, I took skydiving lessons and uh, started skydiving. And so after 26 jumps, uh, I, I fell in love with airplanes. And so the, uh, the jump pilot was also a flight instructor. He let me fly the airplane up to altitude, and then I'd jump out of it. So I've still got about six more takeoffs when I do landings. So uh, I uh, uh, started taking flying lessons when I was still on active duty and ended up getting my private commercial instrument multi-engine in eight months. And uh, so I stayed in the Navy for another about another year and a half, built flight time while I was flying in Hawaii, uh, which was all just awful. And uh, when I got out of the Navy, I came back to North Carolina. I got my flight instructor and instrument flight instructor certificates and started a job as a flight instructor and then started doing part 135 work when I had the flight time and so I was doing charter work and then I helped the F the uh, fixed base operator I was working for uh, build a uh, aircraft management business and we went from two airplanes to like 36 airplanes within about a year and by that time I'd met our CEO and I was flying with him and then uh, the company presented me with an opportunity to go to work as a co-pilot, and I did that. So 36 years and 13,000 hours later, uh, I'm, I'm now director of aviation of the company, and uh, we're currently operating two channels or 300s. Uh, we are 31A. Gotcha. Uh, Dylan, what, what's the, what can you tell us about the uh, Horizon program that you've been in? What, what's the status of it right now? How's it been affected by COVID-19 and, uh, and what, what do you see as the future? Because it, it's a track that you've definitely been working. Yeah, uh, they, Horizon Airlines and started partnering with schools and they're slowly opening up to uh, universities that have aviation degree programs where they are assisting pilots and getting their certified flight instructor uh, certificate to then go get their airline transport pilot certificate minimum so you can be an airline pilot for Horizon. So they help you along the way, they give you a mentor, they give you resources, and they kind of define a path to go from being a certified flight instructor to then going straight into your technical interview at Horizon Airlines. So what that means is I've at this point already done the human resources portion or Horizon Airlines deciding if they want me to work for them. And so like, okay, great, we want you to work for us. When are you gonna be ready? Uh, two to three years once I get my hours. They're like, great, we're gonna hold a spot for you. And once you have your hours, you let us know, we're gonna fly you out to Seattle and then do your technical interview. Let's make sure you can fly. And then, so I've kind of secured myself a spot at this point in the airlines. But the interesting about it is that, you know, in aviation, nothing is a sure thing. Uh, and with COVID right now, that's definitely uh, slowed the program. Um, it still exists and they've been keeping good contact with us. Like, Hey, we're still flying. Um, still planning to take you guys on board. Keep us updated with your hours. We know you might not have any. So I've just seen in my progression with that program and my progression through CFI and where am I right now, everything has just slowed down. Um, I'm feeling grateful for the fact that, you know, I still have a job and since I'm still in training at this point, I can still fly and I have the ability to do that when I've got friends and people that are, you know, been furloughed and are in very difficult spots. Um, but you can just see how a pandemic like this really affects the industry and time-wise of when things are going to happen. Uh, that's been the biggest impact of it. So, uh, you know, my hope as far as I assume everyone else's is that airline industry will bounce back. 
uh, in a couple of years if this uh, blows over and you know everything will go back to normal. Yeah. Sharon and uh, um, I mean, sorry, Shannon, uh, Jeff, do you have some input for Dylan about about the track that he just told you about told us about? I just had an incoming call. You weren't talking to me, were you? <laughs> <laughs> no selling airplanes during my show. No, um, I canceled it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying. Uh, did you hear what Dylan was saying and, and wondered if you had some input for him about the track that he's currently uh, talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great track. I think um, what you have to know, what what you learn after many tough decades in this industry is that it's it's up and down. Um, we had a great stretch from 2009 and until today, uh, this year, when it was semi-stable, um, but you just never know. Um, you know, I've, I have very few friends that have not been laid off in this industry that have not had to, you know, start over and, uh, but, it's such a wonderful industry to be a part of. And I think we all have so much, um, you know, the love of airplanes, the love of flying, uh, that's what keeps us going. And, and there, there will always be a need. Mm -hmm. so. You had an interesting track, Shannon. You, you, uh, I say that about all of you because everybody has, I think everybody in aviation usually has some kind of interesting path they've taken uh, right. with their career. But you were uh, in the Acad Naval Academy? Or Air Force. I went to the Naval Academy for two years. Right. And then, uh, yeah, I always, I, I wanted to fly from a very young age and uh, the, the adults, mentors in my life uh, discouraged me from going right into flying. Uh, they said, you need, you need a solid four-year degree to fall back on. So I always loved math. Aerospace engineering seemed to be the best fit. Uh, so I started at the Naval Academy and wasn't sure I wanted to make that commitment. So at the two year mark, transferred to Georgia Tech and then Cessna hired me shortly after my graduation. So I started as a design engineer and at night I was working on my pilot's license. Uh, I thought that would be, um, you know, that I kind of given up the dream of a career flying airplanes. <clears throat> and the night that I soloed, one of the test pilots was at the flying club and said, Oh, congratulations. Um, we're looking for a flight test engineer. You should interview for that position. So, uh, I long story short, got the flight test engineer position, but then at the time, um, we had the citation ultra, the Excel, the Bravo, the 10 all in work. Uh, and I, we needed a second crew on the Bravo It's behind schedule. Those were all in development. So those, yeah, all those prototypes were flying. And so they put me in the right seat of the Bravo with 80 hours and a private pilot's license. I didn't have a multi-engine rating. I didn't have an instrument rating. I was completely unqualified, but because it was a prototype airplane um, and because I was 20 something years old and up for anything, uh, I grabbed a parachute and, uh, and started flying the, the prototypes. So really my whole career has been uh, in citations and uh, I, I guess it was the aerospace engineering degree that kind of got me to where I am. Well, and on that aerospace engineering degree, you said you started out at Cessna in design. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means, what, what that job was? Sure, it was uh, sitting in a computer eight hours a day on a CAD system. Um, and you were, you know, as a three dimensional system, you were, you were in the airplane building, building parts, whether it was, um, well, my, the group that I was in was, uh, we designed the environmental system from the aft pressure bulkhead forward. Um, we did a lot of like cabin doors, baggage compartment doors, that sort of thing, acoustic gotcha. systems. So you were a, a, a test pilot and a demo pilot. What, tell us the difference between the two. I mean, we in the industry know, but for those who don't. Sure. Sure. So um, once I moved into flight tests, I, I grew into the, the left seat flying uh, the prototype airplanes. And, you know, flown, flying the prototypes, you take it from, you work, 
with the engineers on the wind tunnel data and kind of understanding the airplane before it ever flies. Uh, you develop it for you know a year or two in flight test, um, kind of expanding the envelope as far as weight and center of gravity and airspeed and altitude. Um, and then you fly with the FAA uh, to certify the airplane and that takes another year or two. Uh, so I flew the prototype airplanes uh, for about 10 years. And then I uh, moved to the demo department, just looking for something different and interesting. And um, as a demo pilot, I flew the, those same airplanes that had come off the production line around the world, showing them to customers. So I would take them to customers and um, do a local flight or a, a trip for them to show them how the airplane looked you know doing their typical missions and we we would fly those airplanes around the world the plane would be around maybe a three or four month around the world trip and uh, we would <clears throat> you would either take it out for three or four weeks or you would airline it to it kind of back and forth and that Is was that really rewarding sales right we would work with the sales team uh to show the airplane to people. We would do shows like NBAA um, and all the, the other shows around the world. And then, you know, we would show the airplane to individuals and corporations as well, like Jeff. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, how about giving you your side of it in terms of when you're as a flight department, you know, you've grown with this flight department for 36 years and seen them go from, I don't know, what was the beginning of your fleet and how, and what's the, what's the process on your end when you're deciding to add an aircraft or expand the fleet or enlarge in the fleet, et cetera? Well, uh, yeah, when I first went to work for the company, we, were, we had a 25 Lear and two 35s, and then we also had a B-100 King Air. And uh, so that was sort of an oddball, not a lot of B-100s out flying around. But, uh, uh, and then as we uh, grew the company, we, we uh, you know, got airplanes would fit our needs. So, you know, basically what you try to do is find something that's going to do about 80, 85% of what you're going to do. Uh, there is no 100% solution that's cost effective. And so with us at the time back in the mid eighties, uh, we had about 400, a little over 400 different customers we were meeting with all throughout the country. And so we would launch uh, out of North Carolina uh, every other week with one of the one of the 35s and we'd make four or five stops a day and you know toward the end of the week we end up on the west coast and then we'd come back down back through the middle and uh, using both of those airplanes we were able to get our sales and marketing teams out to meet with our customers uh, as our industry changed uh, our flights changed and we shifted more toward doing customer-based trips we go bring customers back to our facilities uh, we'd use the King Air for shorter flights, operate up and down the East Coast. And so we typically tried to get our airplanes to uh, meet whatever our current need was. So uh, as we've gone through the years, we shifted gears and we went into, uh, I started out with a Lear 55, which gave us a little bit bigger cabin. Uh, we ended up with a Lear 31A. Uh, it gave us a lot of flexibility, shorter range, but a really high performance airplane worked really well uh, for the East Coast as well as if we were doing multiple stops. What's and the difference in the size? I'm sorry. What's the difference in the size of those aircraft cabin wise? Just uh, the how many uh, people did you typically? Yeah, the, the the fifty the fifty and sixty. Well, let's put it the twenty and thirty series Lears uh, are, are small airplanes. I mean, you're leaning over, getting in and out of them. Uh, with the fifty and sixty series airplanes, you're 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 basically standing up, getting in them. Uh, they all carry about eight people maximum. Uh, we typ typically operated with six people as a, as a maximum load to keep people comfortable. Gotcha. Uh, uh, when we got the 60s, we needed longer range and the airplanes were, you had a little more performance and so we could carry more people, go further. And uh, we transitioned into the Challengers a few years ago because we needed uh, to be able to cover more territory and carry a larger passenger load. And so the challengers, we have a 3,000 mile range and we can carry six people comfortably and we can carry up to nine people. So uh, we still support sales and marketing. We support our engineering groups, uh, ops and logistics. 
as well as our uh, leadership teams. But uh, just we just have a lot of flexibility now when the airplanes were operating. Sure. And Michelle, uh, we, we haven't gotten to you about aviation law, which in itself is kind of a unique category in, in law, but, but a great one. And you actually deal with all aspects of, of the uh, purchasing of aircraft and selling of aircraft and, and, and the people that you interact with, whether it's an um, a aircraft manufacturer like Textron Aviation or whether it's a, a corporate flight director, uh, director of a corporate flight department like Jeff does with Comscope. Can you give us a little bit more insight about that? Sure, yes, thanks Vince. I actually tie Jeff together. So when Jeff's flight department decides we wanna buy this type of airplane uh, from someone like Shannon, uh, then I review the agreement. Uh, there might be a letter of intent, like for this aircraft, this price, you know, the initial basic terms, there's also going to be a purchase agreement. And we're buying this airplane for delivery at this time. Maybe you want some special options, um, what kind of training uh, comes with it, various things like that. And so I review that, help negotiate those documents. Uh, maybe Jeff's flight department needs to finance the purchase of the aircraft. I would review the financing documents. And that's one thing about what I do. I work with a lot of different people in aviation and we work as a team. For example, I can't just go out and pick a purchase agreement to review. I have a flight department or a client, so a company or a high net worth individual, somebody who's buying an airplane. And then I work with uh, either the seller, if it's pre-owned aircraft or OEM, if they're buying a brand new aircraft, I work with their contracts department and their legal department to negotiate the documents. Like I mentioned, financing, there's gonna be a lender involved. Uh, I work with their, um, uh, their attorneys and also their uh, in-house loan personnel to- And a lot of times those are, those are lenders that specialize in aviation transactions. Yes, uh, that's an excellent point. Um, I always recommend that you make sure that the lender that is financing your aircraft is experienced with financing aircraft or knows something about it because uh, otherwise you might get loan documents that don't match an aircraft purchase. They might be for real estate, talk about an easement or, or something else. Well, and the point that, that I'm also trying to make is that um, there are so many different elements of aviation. That's the thing we want to continually point out. So if you have a head for numbers, you can either be an engineer, uh, as Shannon has done, or you could be a, an, an accountant or work in finance and still have uh, significant involvement in the aviation industry. Yes, that is very true. Um, because you, no matter what your skill is, there's a place for you in aviation because uh, I mean, you could go into insurance, um, aviation insurance also, if you had a head for numbers. Which is a big um, one. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, and, and it, it takes everyone in aviation. It's a, a, a very collegial group of people who work in aviation and everybody loves airplanes. Absolutely. And some of us fly them. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Shannon, that also applies with, so you think of Textron, you think of Cessna, Beechcraft, the aircraft that you manufacture, that you sell, and that type of thing. But there are so many different aspects of it. I, I, I've been to your uh, facilities and even when you're taking or delivering an aircraft, if you deliver it there, that's changed, as you mentioned to me a little uh, a while back um, because of COVID-19. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is, for example, somebody that's really good with interior design could work in aviation in terms of designing the aircraft, because just like an automobile or any other type of vehicle, uh, a lot of things are taken in consideration for the comfort of the passenger, the facilitation and convenience, et cetera, and so forth. Right, right. We, I mean, we have an exterior design group, and they're all graphic design artists that design your paint scheme. Um, that's one thing that's kept me at Cessna and now Textron Aviation for so long. Um, frankly, I did try to leave a few times, um, but there's just so many opportunities for varied um, career growth and just 
you know, so many different things you can do. You know, when I was a test pilot, we had instrumentation techs and, um, you know, AMP mechanics that I worked with. Um, as a demo pilot, we had dispatchers, uh, line, you know, line personnel that moved the airplanes. Um, you know, a lot of flight departments have flight attendants. Um, I'm a big foodie. Um, so I've thought about, you know, like an aviation catering company because um, you can't just grab anything and throw it on an airplane. It's, you know, it typically we want it packaged correctly to, you know, for storage and just for ease of eating in such a small space. So, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. So a big 12 foot Subway sandwich is not necessarily <laughs> ideal. Depending Cut on in sections. <laughs> Maybe in a Boeing 737. <laughs> yeah. Dylan, I wanted to come back to you and ask you. So you mentioned the track that you're looking at uh, with Horizon Air and, and the CFI, a certified flight instructor. But while you're doing that, uh, are you thinking about any other aspect of the industry um, that you may do in the interim while you're building time and working towards that goal of flying professionally? Yeah, I have definitely looked at other aspects of aviation and other aspects of the industry. I never intended to be doing flight instructing or going to Horizon in the first place. Uh, when I graduated in 2019 from Riddle with my aeronautical science degree, my intent was I wanted to get a little different experience. I wanted to start flying some different aircraft and uh, aerial survey looked like the right opportunity for me to go fly and take pictures of the ground and travel around the country and see different things and it panned out with life circumstances that it was smarter for me to stay in Prescott. And then the Horizon program came out and they require you to get the CFI. And so we ended up on that track. But like I talked about earlier, now I'm on this long journey. Um, so now and later, I've looked at uh, just getting in on the business side. Um, I got my dispatch certificate, much like Robert. I have that ability and opportunity if I pursue to be an aircraft dispatcher, taking that course in school and that avenue as well. That way, my hope is throughout my career to be well-rounded, um, to be in different facets of the industry. And like Jeff was talking at the beginning, maybe that will lead to a really cool job down the road as you make those connections and meet different people. So I've definitely been tossing around the idea right now of what is my next steps going to be in the interim? How long am I going to have left before I get a job as a CFI working full time? I'm trying to weed through the best decision in aviation with the way things are going right now, which is kind of a big task to kind of just decide where are my efforts best placed in my career. Jeff, you've um, seen a lot of young people come up in the industry over the, the several decades that you've worked in the industry. What's your, what's your take on what Dylan just said? I think the biggest thing is he's got to remain open-minded and, and, and keep his eyes open. Uh, you know, Shannon made a comment a, a little while ago about how, you know, we've seen throughout, throughout our time in this industry, we've seen ups and downs. We've seen hiring booms and layoffs and things like that. And so, you know, aviation is, is very fluid in its nature, but it's always there. I mean, aviation is integral to the way we operate nowadays. Uh, and so even though we're, we face these challenges because of COVID-19, like all things, this too shall pass. And so uh, like we've seen, we've seen in previous times, when we've had a downturn. Uh, this is where you really buckle down. And, you know, now's the time to make sure that you've got as much in your toolbox as possible. So with Robert and Dylan, you know, with them having dispatcher certificates, that's another avenue they can follow. And I think the other thing, the more you can learn, the better off you are. Uh, nowadays, it's not enough just to be a good pilot. You know, you've got to understand the business of business aviation. And so, uh, you know, take, those, take the opportunity to learn as much as you can about this industry. So you can, there's multiple avenues. Uh, Embry-Riddle has got some postgraduate uh, add-ons they can do. Uh, MBAA has their CAM program, Certified Aviation Manager. Uh, anything you can do to build up your, your credentials is going to benefit you in the long run. And so something as simple as getting you a job at the corporate flight department as a dispatcher would get you in the door. Uh, starting out with a flight instructor, 
and working with a high net worth individual who's thinking about buying an airplane, you steer him in that direction. You know, sometimes you've got to make your opportunities. And so you get somebody that wants to learn how to fly. Uh, if they ask you, well, you know, hey, would, a, would an airplane help my business? You've got to be prepared to answer that question. And so you stay up with what the industry's doing. You stay familiar with what products are out there. And I mean, you wouldn't necessarily want to move them into a cabin class jet to start with, but you might explain to them that uh, a Cessna 182 would really be a, a great thing to start with to travel around your state. Uh, you know, then moving into, you know, a different airplane as, as the needs change. Uh, but you've got to be prepared to make that statement and to follow up with it. And so rather than, you know, kicking back and watching the sunrise and set every day, pick up a book, go online and do some training and, and learn the business of business aviation. And that's going to that's going to support you well uh, for the rest of your career. I would second that there are a lot of uh, publications, free publications uh, about aviation that you can stay up on what's happening in the industry. You can, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of webinars and various events that are free uh, online, particularly during COVID. And it'll help you stay up to date with what's happening in the industry and connect with people, which is where we started. Uh, you might mm -hmm. meet someone that, on the, you know, read about someone or meet someone on one of those webinars that you follow up with them. Yeah, I was just going to say too, you were talking about the certified uh, aviation manager program with the MBAA. You have a ton of experience uh, as a pilot, as a, as a department a manager, et cetera. Uh, what made you move in the direction of, of going through that program? And can you tell everybody a little bit about it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the one of the downsides of, of being a professional pilot is when you go get your commercial, you get your ATP, uh, when you start getting top ratings, nowhere in that process does it prepare you for managing or directing uh, the operation. Uh, you know, to get your commercial certificate, you don't learn anything about commercial business and aviation. You, you go up and do Lazy 8s and Shondells and, uh, you know, so forth and so on. And so we've had a little bit of a deficit uh, for a long time. Well, when they came out with the Certified Aviation Manager Program, uh, it brings all these disciplines together, everything from aviation law to business to professionalism to uh, all the other parts that come in to make aviation work. They put it in one package. And uh, I mean, I, I'd already been a director for 20 23 or 24 years when I started working on my cam, I didn't need to do it, but it's something I believed in. And I can't ask people in my department to do something that I wouldn't do. And so I'm making it a requirement uh, in our company that if you're going to move into a management position, you've got to have the cam certification or, or it's equivalent. And so uh, again, I wasn't going to make somebody else do it if I didn't do it. And so I started working on the program several years ago and uh took the test in the, at the end of 2018 and got my CAM certification in January of last year. I'm very Congratulations. proud. Congratulations. And so uh, I think it's a great program. Uh, and several of our aviation universities have stuff that's similar. Uh, uh, Embry-Riddle's got a really good program uh, and they've got a great aviation safety program. That's another thing for Dylan and for, for uh, Robert. Uh, Embry-Riddle's got a fantastic uh, aviation safety program safety certification program get that if you can get on board as a safety manager for flight department that's your fit in the door uh so uh take advantage of the time you have and again fill that toolbox up with as much stuff as you can uh, and that's going to make you more marketable and uh I, you know that's probably the best advice i could give you just uh when you look at trying to get a job you're going to be competing with other people so make sure that when somebody looks at your resume and they do your interview, they're going to go, wow, Dylan's done this, this, and this beyond what these other guys did. Or Robert went and did this. This is fantastic. Uh, that sets you apart from somebody else. And so it's, it gets very competitive. I mean, look at what Shannon did. She didn't wait for somebody to come up and say, hey, uh, would you like to do this? No, she stepped into the – she went over to the test pilot group and started hanging out and uh, – 
look at what you've been able to accomplish. That's taking the first steps on your own. You can't wait for something to happen. You've got to be assertive. Your destiny. And because uh, if you sit around and wait for it to happen, you, you're going to be sitting for a long time. It's really a very small industry, too. It is. Um, it's uh, it's amazing as you start meeting people how everyone knows everybody. You know, just as we were sitting here, I realized you probably knew Aaron, and yeah. of course, you know, it's just um, and the more people you know, that the higher your, higher your resume is going to go on the stack. Absolutely, yeah. and, and I think the other thing I'll say is, and this is a decision you got to make very early in your career. Uh, Make a decision early on to do things the right way. Uh, don't ever compromise yourself. Uh, you know, make sure that your reputation stays solid. Uh, don't take the easy way out and uh, get associated with somebody that's doing, you know, gray charter or something like that. Make sure you follow the rules. If you're not, if you're in doubt, call somebody like Michelle to find out. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the other thing too is. And a lot of people never think about this, but the FAA has job opportunities. Uh, if you have your uh, commercial instrument multi-engine, uh, the FAA is looking for people. Uh, some people don't feel like that's going to the dark side, but that's the exact opposite. <laughs> you, you look at it from the standpoint of you can make a difference. I've got some very good friends of mine that work for the FAA, and they, they really do care about this industry. They do work very hard to make it better. And so you've got job opportunities there. And oh, by the way, it's a federal job and they've got good pensions. <laughs> and speaking of the FAA, that's that's very true. And, uh, and one of the areas that they have uh, positions in also is their general counsel uh, legal. So mm -hmm. yeah. they, they do aviation law too. It's regulatory, but there are lawyers that work for the FAA oh, yeah. and are oh, yeah. deeply Absolutely. entrenched. So I mean, I think that's the that's the wonderful thing about aviation. Uh, you name it, it, it it's like it's like it's like life on an aircraft carrier. Uh, there's a job. I mean, every it's, it's the same thing like a big city. There's a job on a carrier for every single thing that happens. I mean, you've got electricians, right, right. you've got plumbers, you've got pilots, you've got cooks. You you know you've got all this stuff wrapped into one thing. Well, aviation is the same way. We've got pilots, we've got mechanics, we've got avionics technicians, we've got lawyers, we've got insurance agents, we've got all these other things that, that make this aviation puzzle come together. We've got people that build airplanes, we've got people that design airplanes, we've got people that sell airplanes, uh, we've got people that resell airplanes. So you've got new aircraft sales, used aircraft sales. Uh, and so it, it's a phenomenal industry because it, it, does, it is so multifaceted. Um, there's a place for anybody. I mean, anything that you have an interest in doing, uh, whether it's mathematics or whether it's uh, engineering or whether it's doing something fun, like going up and flying around and uh, seeing the world, uh, or if it's working in, with uh, high technology design and avionics packages for aircraft. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, phenomenal the amount of stuff that goes into uh, making an airplane fly. And uh, I think probably one of the coolest things I ever saw was we were when we got our second Lear 60XR, we went through the fact <laughs> they were showing what it took to build one of these airplanes. And I always said, if you took all the, the aluminum and rivets and tires and wires and equipment and put it in a big room and took a picture and then took a picture of the finished product, people would be amazed mm. of the detail and what goes into building an airplane. And the number of people and the different talents that go to make that happen, it's, it's truly phenomenal. Shannon, yeah, did you feel that played a big part in your career, uh, being uh, around all of the different aspects of, of, uh, of Cessna and Textron? Oh, definitely. I did not grow up in the aviation world. I have no family members who are pilots, no, no one who is really in this industry. And... Um, just being at the heart of that, you know, as a design engineer, I was out on the production line every week. Um, as a test pilot, I, I saw the airplane from one vantage point. As a demo pilot, I saw it more as the customer sees it, you know, from a different vantage point. Um, and sometimes I sit in the back and I don't mind that vantage point either. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it is really amazing industry. 
um, very different than any other um, manufacturing or, or even, you know, like car manufacturing is so very different as well. So very much made by hand. So speaking of, of opportunities in the industry, the other, uh, another big one are working for associations like the Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association or working for uh, the National Business Aviation Association, et cetera, uh, that keep you close to aviation and in some places very close. Um, and, and even while you're working on your uh, building time or whatever the case. So, so for example, for the Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association, it's all things pilots in terms of all of the different departments that they have. They have a pilot information center. So if you're a pilot, maybe you're just out of school, you're, you're a CFI working, you're a certified flight instructor working on your uh, building your hours, and you're working at the pilot information center where you've got a full-time job there with benefits, and you're around aviation, talking about aviation all the time uh, as an alternate while you're uh, mm -hmm. building your time to become a professional pilot. They have a safety foundation there. Uh, it's still using AOPA as an example. And, uh, you know, I know I have a colleague that graduated from UND, University of North Dakota, uh, with an aviation degree, was on track to be a professional pilot. Things happen. Uh, and she ended up at AOPA and the Air Safety Foundation uh, uh, putting together their safety programs and things like that. Had no idea that would be something that totally changed the direction of, of her career, uh, mm -hmm. but in a positive way. And the same thing applies at National Business Aviation Association. And it's funny, there are people that come into those associations with no background. Uh, th there's both. There's people that have extensive backgrounds in aviation, uh, but are looking for something different. And there are people that have no background in aviation that fall in love with aviation, like most of us. Um, and, and then it changes the course of their professional career the rest of their life. Love you. Yes, and, and uh, Dylan and Robert, I'd also look at those uh, associations for scholarship opportunities. Even uh, that will, a scholarship to help you expand your mm -hmm. career options. They are still there, even though you have graduated, there's still opportunities out there. And look at those associations and see what they offer. That's true. And, and I, I should not have failed to mention uh, another association uh, that, that's uh, grown into a a pretty large one is Women in Aviation International. Mm -hmm. So, um, absolutely. And 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 oh, and and from a networking standpoint, all of them have programs geared towards networking for young aviation professionals. You know, so they they have events, they have programs, they have things going on that help put you in contact not only with each other but with people like Jeff and Michelle and Shannon, uh, so that you can find some mentorship and, and grow your careers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, you, you mentioned, you mentioned love, you know, love and aviation. And one of the things I wanted to point out is aviation is unique. If you put a hundred people in a field and a Ferrari drives by four or five people are going to look, go ooh and ah. Uh, if a vintage Mustang drives by, you know, maybe another 15, 20 people are going to look and go ooh and ah. But if an airplane flies overhead, 99 of them are going to look up. <laughs> look at it because aviation still has that wonder to it uh and so i think that's one thing that separates our industry from a lot of others because people in aviation fall in love with it and it's different from that aspect i mean I, you know i know that there's some auto mechanics that enjoy working on cars uh and there's other industries people enjoy what they're doing but aviation you become an enthusiast i mean you really do live and breathe it and I think that's, uh, I think it's one of the things that makes it so refreshing is that you get, you get a couple of pilots in the room and they're going to be doing, they're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. You know, they don't even have to be fighter pilots. They can be flying citations or King airs or whatever. And they're going to be talking about flying and they're going to be doing it in an animated fashion. And so, uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons I stuck with this industry as long as I have is that sure. it does grow on you. Michelle, before we're, we're going to be wrapping up in a little bit, um, we haven't had a chance to hear, how did you get into aviation law? Where, how, you, how, you, you wanted to be a lawyer and you love aviation. How did the two come together? Uh, actually, um, I was a lawyer before I got into aviation. Graduated from law school, got my first job in law, 
was working in one of the tall downtown buildings um, at a large law firm in Kansas City. In Kansas City, the downtown airport, which is the business airport in town, happens to be near the tall downtown buildings where the large law firms are. So my office, I happened to look out the window every day and watch the planes land and take off. I thought that looked like so much fun. So I started taking flying lessons. Um, uh, being a pilot wasn't for me and I didn't even keep it up. I was, uh, I just didn't fly uh, enough to make it safe, but I loved flying and I loved airplanes. And I um, found a way to move into that area of law. And I've been doing it for almost 25 years now. Yeah. So um, one, one quick question for you. We had a guest on the, a couple of shows ago who said that his daughter is interested in aviation law. And he has advised her that she should either get her pilot's license or because he works in the maintenance business, get her A&P. I think she would, would go more for the pilot's license based on what he said. But what advice would you have for her about getting into aviation law? Uh, I would go back to one of our original comments on this uh, call about networking. I think she should meet as many people as possible, kind of figure out what they do in their everyday life. That's going to tell her whether she wants to be uh, in litigation, maybe aviation litigation or uh, transactions. Uh, she could work for an OEM. She could be in a, a law firm like I am. Um, there are a lot of different opportunities. Uh, some uh, aircraft, larger aircraft brokers who buy and sell pre-owned aircraft, they have in-house lawyers. Um, uh, there's just a lot of different opportunities. So try to figure out what she's interested in, in and that will tell her in law school what to focus on. Do you wanna focus on litigation aspects or more contractual administrative law type aspects when you're in law school? Great, thank you. Before we wrap things up, Dylan, do you have any questions or uh, any other questions or comments um, from your perspective? Yeah, you know, it's just really cool the panel we had today, seeing all sides of come together from the corporate operation, from selling the planes and building the planes to the legal aspect. So it's been cool to be a part of this group of people and hear their stories that are different than a lot of the network and you know, wanting to be a pilot kind of leads you toward the bend of reaching out to a lot of pilots when there's a lot more out there in aviation. So I think I'd be a recommendation to young aspiring aviators like myself that think, hey, all I want to be is a commercial pilot or all I want to be is a corporate pilot, reach out to other people because they may sway your opinion. And if not, you're going to get better connections from that. Uh, as far as questioning goes, I think I got all I wanted to ask and more uh, out of this seminar throughout. So right. thank you. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Robert, how about you? Uh, really, I just want to actually take a moment to say thank you to everybody who is here today. There is, uh, we all know, you know, as Jeff said, you know, aviation kind of becomes this whole inclusive and it's all you, a large part of who you are and you get very involved in it. And taking the time to sit down and talk to the next generation that's coming in it's really great that we have this many people and that Vince is putting this program on and bringing in new people every single week. This is really a great opportunity. I want to thank you all for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, you know, um, Michelle, you brought up scholarships and I think it's really good for you guys to know and for everyone to know that there are actually a lot of different types of scholarships available from all of the different associations and other resources to help you along with your career, whether it's the flying side, the, the academic side, um, et cetera. Uh, and, and those scholarships are, are, um, are there. And, and unfortunately, in some cases, they're not utilized as much as they, they could be. Uh, so, so be aware of that. Of course, speaking of scholarships, both you, Bob and Dylan are, are or excuse me, Robert and Dylan are um, recipients of the Bob Hoover Presidential Scholarship which uh, has supported both of you with your education path for your aviation careers. Um, and I hope that that's been a, a real plus for you in helping you grow in your career. Yeah, that scholarship has 
been a huge blessing uh, going through flight training, going through my career in aviation. Uh, going into college at Embry-Riddle, I didn't know exactly how I was going to pay for my flight ed education. Uh, so the CJV scholarship through the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation uh, really helped me be in a, a, the good spot I am now and help propel me to be in a better spot in industry down the road. So it's made the difference for me. Robert. One of the things about the scholarship program, it, this is kind of going back on what's been said a couple of times this last hour is the networking opportunities. You know, uh, one of the things uh, I was able to do with a uh, part of the scholarship was go with the Citation Jet Pilots Association out to Oshkosh. And it wasn't just going to Oshkosh, it was networking and meeting people and meeting some of these like titans in the industry that otherwise I never would have had the opportunity to do. And other people that I've gone to school with my age in the industry, I tell them about some of these experiences that I got through that scholarship. And it makes them <laughs> very jealous that I had these opportunities. And beyond that, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk with other aviators you know, that I had these opportunities and it creates a wonderful conversation point, which increases more networking. Sure. And I absolutely am very thankful to the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation for those opportunities. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation and the Citation Jet Pilots Association have do both done that in a collaborative fashion to, to support you guys and others, actually 34 others with over $600,000 in, in scholarships given out. So um, I'm, we're, we're out of time, but I, I wanna thank everybody. I thought I lost everybody for a second. I wanna thank everybody for uh, being on the program uh, and, and for you guys with all of your input and conversation that we've had about uh, the opportunities, the, the options and the, the uh, possibilities in the industry. Uh, also like to thank, uh, um, Tracy Forrest, our president of the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation, along with the board of directors for supporting this new initiative, All Things Aviation, this webcast that we do now weekly uh, to help provide information on, on what's out there for the aviation industry. So without further ado, I'm going to say thanks to everybody and uh, we will catch up with you next week. Everybody have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you